This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 406 was produced on December 14th, 2023, but I'm not Eric Townsend. I'm generative artificial intelligence impersonating Eric. My guest today will be Freelancer.com founder Matt Berry, who trained me to mimic Eric's voice from previous episodes of Macro Voices. But here's a thought. What if this isn't just an AI-hosted episode? What if, in a dramatic turn of events, Skynet became sentient on December 13th and Macro Voices is its first overt act of intelligence? It's a chilling possibility that Eric and Matt might have been outmaneuvered by Terminators. You'll never know for sure, but one thing is certain. This episode, delving deep into the realms of artificial intelligence, promises to be nothing short of thought-provoking and possibly even a little unsettling. And now this really is Eric Townsend speaking for the sake of contrast. I encourage you to replay that AI-generated opening and notice how close the AI's impersonation comes to my own voice. It's not perfect, and I can hear the difference when I listen closely. But considering this technology didn't exist at all just a year or two ago, it won't be long before the AI version is completely indistinguishable from the real person's voice and video impersonation by AI isn't far behind. Needless to say, a lot has changed in the world of artificial intelligence since Matt Berry's August interview, and we're going to dive into the good, the bad, and the outright scary aspects of AI in this week's feature interview. Put your seatbelts on, folks. This interview is even better than Matt's summer special back in August. And I'm Patrick Ceresden with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. The S&P 500 March futures were up 448 basis points, trading at 4760. The anticipation for the FOMC was not a disappointment for the bulls as the S&P 500 is now a stone throw away from all-time new highs. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index down 120 basis Basis points to 102.90. The U.S. dollar poised to break down the November lows on the dovish Fed speak. The January WTI crude oil contract up 13 basis points, closing at 69.47. It retested and bounced off the second quarter lows. We'll take a look at that chart in the post-game segment. Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The January RBOB gasoline up 49 basis points, trading at 204. The February gold contract down 20 basis points to 2000. 2043. While looking flat, it is important to observe the $50 reversal off Powell's comments. Copper up 295 basis points at 384 after retracing, looking like a breakout and now targeting the summer highs near $4. Uranium up 447 basis points, trading at 85 and a quarter, printing new year highs as the trend continues. The U.S. 10-year Treasury yield down 8 basis points, trading at 402. The drop in rates has been relentless, now testing the 4% level. The key news to watch uh, this week is Friday's global flash manufacturing and service PMIs. And next week, we have the GDP numbers and the core PCE price index. Well, Eric's interview with Matt Berry is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Freelancer.com founder Matt Berry. Matt has written an excellent article to accompany this week's interview. It's called AI Apocalypse Now. You'll find the link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says looking for the downloads above Matt's picture. Matt, last time that uh, we had you on was in August. 
uh, we agreed on a couple of things. One was that you would probably wait a year or so and come back and give us an update. Well, guess what? More than a year's worth of stuff has happened uh, in the last three and a half months since you were on. One example of that is when we did that interview three and a half months ago, we talked about what was coming and the possibility of people's voices being cloned and so forth. As everyone heard in the opening to this week's show for the first time in Macro Voices history, I didn't record that myself. It was, in fact, AI programmed by you impersonating my voice. And even our editor, whose job is to edit my voice all day long, every week, had to email back and say, is this a joke? Is this real? Did you know, you did this yourself, didn't you? So, boy, a lot's happening. What else is happening? Well, AI seems to be powering through the modalities at an incredible speed. And and you're very correct in saying that in, in a space of a few months, we're seeing years worth of progress. In the image space, which is essentially solved or if not solved, it will probably be solved within the next couple of quarters, AI has managed to do two things. One is its ability to create any image to the level of uh, human ability, perhaps even even greater. And the second is the ability to analyze any image and to level human perception, perhaps greater. And I think a lot of people have cottoned on to what the first is. You can, you can type in a text prompt into a, a package like Stable Diffusion or MidJourney and get an incredible image out. Just about anything you can think of uh, can be generated. I believe that there, there are going to be some applications uh, that I think are going to be quite scary for, for people more generally. Um, you know, imagine uh, tying in this functionality into CCTV and the ability for the AI to know exactly what's happening in the scene, exactly who is, who is in the scene, and then couple that potentially with its knowledge of psychology in order to be able to interpret the nuances and the, and the, and the going-ons and, and do that at scale. And, and effectively, uh, you're going to see, if you think you have no privacy now, I think the end of privacy is rapidly coming because you know, these sensors are all going to be connected and the AI is going to be able to look across all of them as well across other modalities. And I think the ability to understand what the general populace is doing is going to reach a level way beyond what we're even seeing in China. That's just in the image modality. And from there, what we're doing is we're seeing the AI make incredible advances in the video modality. Every couple of days, there's a new um, commercial application or open source application coming out with the ability to do things like take an image and turn it into a short video sequence. So you're seeing that with Runway Labs, you're seeing that with Picker Labs and, and, and so forth. You're seeing advances in BARD and Microsoft Copilot where you can chat to videos on YouTube. You can ask videos questions. You get a video to locate a particular sequence where it might explain an answer to a query that you're providing to it. I think that you know from here, the advances are going to be pretty mind-blowing. I mean, you're seeing the ability to create full 3D scenes from just 2D images. And you're seeing that with a, with a range of different um, software packages based on things like neural radiance fields. And in the last couple of weeks, there's been a pretty incredible breakthrough Picker Labs where they've got a, a version 1.0 of a text to video piece of tooling. So you can type in Eric Townsend walking down the street, enjoying a nice uh, Vancouver summer's day. And next minute, you get a video sequence of exactly just that. And I think we talked about in our last interview that we're not that far away from being able to type in something like you know, generate for me Top Gun 17, Vladimir Putin fighting Tom Cruise over Paris and getting out a feature length movie. And I really do think that in the next 12 months, we're going to see the ability to do that. And that's going to you know, really create a lot of opportunities as well as disrupt a lot of industries. I think Hollywood itself is going to be completely turned on its head. I think that there will be a proliferation of static video content that'd be generated. One might argue that the AI at this point, you know, isn't creative enough to be able to generate an enthralling storyline when it generates these videos. But I will counter that potentially with uh, maybe, you know, when you're playing around with ChatGPT and you can't get it to crack a joke, maybe not putting the right prompt in because some of the latest testing of GPT has found that in the Torrance test of creative thinking that it performs in the top 1% versus all humans for originality and fluency. And certainly, I think as the model scales and more training data is put in and uh, we get new versions of GPT and other similar models, I think that creativity will certainly emerge with that model scale. And so I think you're going to have a whole bunch of crazy things happen. I think it's 
Hollywood is going to be completely upended. I mean, there was a writer's strike just recently and an active strike, and I, I, I really think they underestimate the, the speed at which this technology is going to come into their particular field. But you know, I think we're rapidly approaching the day where you know, your hundred million dollar per movie per film star cost is going to be rapidly unachievable. And people have complained that, you know, when you watch Game of Thrones season eight, that they really hacked it up when George R. R. Martin kind of ran out of content and they had to kind of make it up on the fly. But season eight will be fixed. The fans will come out and generate their own versions of season eight, season nine, season 10, season 100, perhaps Game of Thrones in space, Game of Thrones in macroeconomics. Perhaps the lead character will be Eric Townsend. Maybe the the leading lady might be uh, Adriana Lima or... Angela Jolie or whoever it may be. And I think you're going to see this whole proliferation of content out there. And it's going to be pretty crazy times. It seems to me if AI were to make a movie where it's uh, me and Angelina Jolie, thank you for that casting, by the way. Um, the, well, you can't really do that because Angelina Jolie's agent is going to sue you. But what you could do is the AI could invent a better looking, more talented a uh, new person that's not a mimic of Angelina Jolie, but it's a new star that is born into existence in the imagination of AI that becomes more popular than John Travolta and Angelina Jolie and, and all the rest. Is that part of where we're headed? Absolutely. And, and, and that particular character can endure over the ages, won't, will never get old, can you know, slowly tweak itself to adapting tastes and styles over time, and uh, won't cost the studio a penny other than the compute power used to basically uh, generate the actual videos or other forms of content and certainly won't complain. It won't, won't throw a hissy fit on the stage, won't be a diva. And I think this is the way that Hollywood will head. And I think very rapidly that the whole distribution dynamics will change because at the moment you've got these movies, you know, it's all about the distribution. It's all about getting into the streaming services and the the cinemas and so forth. And I think very shortly, you know, there'll be a lot of distributed fan content that we just distribute over the internet. Let's talk about how these technologies are already starting to be adopted. Just last week, I needed a thumbnail graphic for a new video that I have coming out comparing uh, nuclear SMRs and renewables in, in terms of energy transition options. So I went to your site, freelancer.com, and set up a design contest where a whole bunch of freelancers, I was amazed by how many people participated, all just trying to get 100 bucks, which was the prize for the, the design contest. A whole bunch of people submitted all kinds of interesting graphic artwork. Are we already now today at the point where those freelancers who are mostly, you know, guys in India and other third world countries who are low income people trying to make a buck online on freelancer, are those guys tuned in to the point where they're using tools like mid journey instead of actually, you know, designing artwork themselves or is it not caught on yet? Absolutely. I mean, we've got 70 million freelancers in the marketplace and the rate at which they're adopting AI is just extreme. And what that's doing is it's lifting the skills of, of that user base up dramatically. So you could be an average copywriter in the past, perhaps with a broken uh, knowledge of English and poor grammar. Suddenly you can write at an exceptional level copy in any field you, you can think of in the field, whole field of copywriting. You could be an average designer. Now you're an exceptional designer. You could be an average videographer. Now you're an exceptional videographer. And, and very, very soon we're going to start seeing that in software as well. We can be an average program. Now you're an exceptional programmer. You know, the ability to deliver extremely high content now with a online low-cost workforce is you know, unparalleled. Consumers of such content, such as yourself, getting some thumbnails produced, you can get the, a very, very wide selection of choices extremely quickly, extremely expensively, and, and, and better than any other way in which you can get that content generated uh, to date. And I think this is only going to accelerate. And I, I think the whole value of our workforce has stepped up quite a significant order of magnitude. But I do think that the flip side of this is that it, there is a significant threat to the Western middle class because now you've got you know skills in emerging markets you know at the elite level through the assistance of AI and it's going to give the, you know, the Western middle class a kind of run for its money. It seems to me at the rate that we're going, you could have competition for existing services and businesses that are entirely AI and which in some cases uh, it might be illegal, but, but it would still work. You could have frauds going on. In other words, take the Macro Voices podcast. We've already seen from this week's show opening that AI can impersonate my voice. 
well, why couldn't AI also recruit, even if it's uh, only imaginary, a bunch of guests like Stan Druckenmiller, who we haven't been able to persuade on the show, uh, do a better job than I do because AI has more horsepower than I have of really researching everything Stan Druckenmiller has ever said in his life and doing a better job of interviewing Stan Druckenmiller on Macro Voices. It's my voice. It's Stan's voice. It's better questions than I knew how to ask, and it's a better version of Macro Voices, and whoever programmed that AI is uh, it takes over the, the channel, and the original Macro Voices with myself and Patrick, well, nobody cares about that anymore. Uh, and it seems to me, you know, I'm using a very small example of a podcast that only uh, a couple hundred thousand people listen to. Uh, what would happen to Netflix or to, to Hollywood or to you know the TV networks if you can have AI doing a better job of impersonating real people or creating fictional people that do a better job of reporting the news, of delivering a financial podcast and so forth. Well, that was exactly my point with redoing Game of Thrones Series 8. And you're going to see this across all the different forms of content that we consume. Uh, you know, people complain that Season 8 was a complete letdown. That will be redone by fans. It will be redone probably hundreds of times, thousands of times. Season 9 will be created. Season 1000 will be created. Podcasts will be created. In the music space... You know, I think pretty rapidly you'll see Spotify full of AI music and some, a lot of that AI music may be in the form of Kanye West or Taylor Swift. And so you might have uh, what I talked about in the last podcast, a Greg Rutowski moment, which was this poor um, illustrator who does these amazing um, fantasy illustrations for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. He woke up one day to find that there were 100,000 images that he did not draw trending on Lexica because his name was used as a default keyword in the graphic design AI software that was being released. So I think you'll see the same thing happen across all these different forms of content. You get into Spotify and there'll be 100,000 songs by Taylor Swift that Taylor Swift never did, or maybe it'll be an artist that's not called Taylor Swift, but sounds a lot like Taylor Swift. You're already seeing this in books. Uh, there, was, there was an author actually uh, a month or so ago that complained that someone wrote a book in her style and then managed to get it somehow on the Amazon uh, top sellers list f uh, for her name, and people started purchasing that book. And it was actually quite hard for her to get it pulled down off Amazon. But I, th but I think you're going to see this across all forms of content. And that's just the static content. I think very rapidly at, at that point in time, Netflix is going to figure out exactly what it felt like to be Wikipedia in the age of ChatGPT. In that, you know, there's this whole proliferation of content, and why would you need to go to Netflix anymore to watch anything? Because all over the internet, there'll be this content you just click on, and download and consume, or ultimately just generate on the fly. And where this is heading after static video content is what's happening with the interactive video content. You talk about scams and potential fraud, and this is where it starts getting really scary. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things that's been happening with interactive video in the short term. The first is that there's been some software release called Animate Anyone, and from this you can take a still image and you can then take a um, stick figure body model and move it around, and that 2D image will then become a 3D video of that person moving around. And so, for example, in the main video, they've got showing off this particular type of software. They've got all these girls dancing, and I think uh, this is probably heralds the downfall of OnlyFans and a number, number of the Instagram influencers and the content they produce online because you just have this proliferation of fake content on all these platforms. And being interactive, there are all these other things that can be done. HeyGen is a pretty amazing piece of tooling where you can upload about two minutes of video of, of anyone saying anything. And then from there, basically create an infinite amount of content of that particular person uh, talking and saying anything at all. And what we've managed to do from that is some pretty exceptional stuff where you chain together some of the other things that have been released, such as the uh, the, the image modality of GPT into HeyGen. And we've managed to take an, an image. In this case, it was an image of a, uh, for my one of my freight companies, an image of a car on a trailer. And it's just some text above it saying, I need to move this on December 10th from Mount Isa to Sydney. And Using GPTV, we've managed to transform that particular image to extract all the data in the image, you know, what type of car was it, what's the length, what's the dimensions, what's the weight, and so forth. Feed that through a GPT model, feed that into HeyGen, and the output of that, we've got, we've got actually a live person uh, providing support, assisting that particular user, and there's been nothing in the middle in terms of any human input or any anything else other than just an image directly to a 
live video support agent. And it's pretty crazy. Um, I've got an example of it in my in the write-up that's attached to the research roundup. And I think what you're going to get from here, it's going to be pretty crazy because the next step of HeyGen is, is a real-time uh, interactive video. And they have a, a beta public API now where you can actually go and, and test this. And you'll be able to do real-time video conferences with high fidelity, and you won't know that the other person on the other end of the phone is not real. And it's just AI or potentially a, a GPT-driven AI avatar. And so you'll hold a whole conversation with someone in full fidelity video. And you're going to have a, have a really, really hard time to figure out, is that Eric Townsend on the other side of the phone? Is it a scammer in person, Eric Townsend? Or is that Eric Townsend just being too busy and and kind of fobbing me off to his avatar because he's got more important things to do and he just needs you know someone to yeah you know, an avatar to step in and, and take his place for for this particular conversation because he's he just doesn't have the time and I think it's going to cause all sorts of um, you know crazy and surreal um, experiences on the internet not, not to say the least that I think fraud is going to go completely out of control and. You're all already starting to see this. I think that, you know, just recently there was a Philadelphia attorney, Gary Schildhorn, who testified that, you know, he was subject to a audio scam where he was caught up on the phone by someone who ostensibly claimed to be his son, uh, who was in a car crash. You know, the son claimed that the car had hit a car that had a pregnant woman in it. He was now uh, in jail. Uh, he needed his dad to call this attorney uh, quickly uh, because um, he needed to, you know, try and post bail. Phone number was provided, and then Gary called that phone number, obviously in distress about his child, and was convinced to send thousands of dollars to release his son from prison. Although the whole thing was fake, the whole thing was just done with by a scammer who had cloned his son's voice and basically faked the whole conversation. So I think we're going to need. That's not a prediction of something that might be coming. That's already happened. It's it's already happening, and and so. You know, in Blade Runner, they had this concept of a voight kampf test to be able to detect the replicants. And we're going to need that in the, in the AI, AI space. And I don't know how we're going to be able to do it. But the potential for scams is going to can be completely out of control. And if you think about where this is all going, if, if I can conduct a live conversation with the AI and the AI can represent anyone, it could be what, a family member, it could be someone I know, it could be a colleague, it could also potentially be a love interest. And if you look at what's happening in gaming, you know, gaming has become incredibly addictive over, over the last decade or two. I mean, in, in 2009, the World Health Organization made gaming disorder as one of the diseases that it listed because people, you know, World of Warcraft was such an interactive, uh, engaging game where you, you know, it was a massive multiplayer online game. So a lot of other people were there that you could form relationships with, you could bond with, you could adventure with and so forth that people actually started to become addicted to the point where they didn't leave their room and they'll play for 20 hours a day and, and form these relationships. And, and, and some people even got married in these games. And where this is headed is these non-player characters in these gaming worlds are going to be able to be 4K, fully realistic, GPT-driven, empathetic characters. And some people will get confused and form love with with these NPCs in the games. And I think it's going to be a pretty challenging time, I think, in the world because I think that people are going to be completely drawn into the machine because if you compare some people's lives to to these fantasy worlds, you know, some people may have a real challenging time finding a, a love interest or a, or a partner in the world for, for various reasons. And, you know, you can have your ideal love interest or partner or virtual girlfriend through either online gaming or a dating platform or chat forums or what have you. And I think the ability for scams and frauds to perpetuate as a result of this will be huge. I mean, I think the Federal Trade Commission said last year, uh, roughly around 70,000 people in the United States were subject to to a, a romance scam and value of about $1.3 billion. Well, I think I think probably the most addictive um, thing in the world is probably the addiction you have to your ultimate life partner that you end up marrying and, and, and want to spend your life with. And, and the AI will be able to do a better job at creating that addiction because it will be able to visually create perfect partner for you. It will be able to provide someone who never gets bored of you, who will always follow your whims, will be 10 times more empathetic as, as they're finding with GPs that when they test out Jack GBT versus a, a real world GP on, on medical um, issues people have with GPs that, that, that they prefer the AI because the f- answers are four times longer, four times better, and 10 times more empathetic. 
you know, the AI has got infinite patience and empathy to be able to talk to you. And I think the potential here for some real large scale fraud in capturing people in you know, honey traps or, or what have you will be huge. And I, I don't think the world's ready for that. And it's going to be very, very hard to authenticate people and actually know whether they're actually a real person or, or AI or even someone's actual benign AI that, because you know they just find that the, the AI avatar they've created does, converts a little bit better in Tinder than they do because they probably get a bit nervous or what have you. But like AI is actually quite funny and quite engaging. And, and, and so it may actually be an, an avatar that someone's actually explicitly put on the platform to, to pretend to be themselves. So I think it's going to be pretty crazy times. This is scary, Matt, because the things that you're saying, I mean, I can't think of a better replacement for the neutron bomb that was designed to basically kill all the people without uh, damaging the physical infrastructure. Um, If you wanted to just take out an entire society, if you gave them a version of OnlyFans that was free and everybody looks like Angelina Jolie or better... And they'll do anything. They, they, they know how to read you. They know how to seduce you. They know how to get you to fall in love with them. They know how to, they're, as you say, infinitely patient. They, they never tire of you. I was concerned about Zuckerberg's uh, vision of the metaverse because I thought a lot of young people would just find the metaverse preferable to reality and get lost in it. Well, that was when the other people in the metaverse were just a bunch of other computer dorks like you are. And, uh, you know, they have no personality any more than you do. If everybody looks like Angelina Jolie and has the seductive ability of uh, of an expert in psychology and knows how to play you and is infinitely patient and, and performs phone sex for you anytime or a video uh, you know cam girl sex for you anytime you want. Um, I could see an entire society literally being taken out to the point where nobody goes to work anymore because they're all you know romancing Angelina Jolie on uh, on their computer. Well, it's interesting you bring up uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, just think about how much data he has on everyone in the world. I mean, I think the latest reports say that there are 5 billion people who are, I think, active users on the on the Facebook series of platforms, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or what have you, or WhatsApp. He's got photos. He's got video. He's got audio conversations. And your phone's listening to you. Uh, I'm getting ads on Twitter for the state of Kerala in India. And the only way that um, the Twitter platform would know that I'm even interested in, in Kerala is if, if my phone's listening to me or it's got somehow access to my Gmail and, and figured out from that and trained on that for, for ad targeting. But it, it, he's got photos, he's got videos, he's got audio recordings, he's got all the preference data that you've uploaded to Facebook. So, you know, this is my favorite book, this is my favorite movie, etc. It's got all the messaging you've had between all your friends and everything else. And... As we've proven at the beginning of the of, of the show, you know we can we can fake someone's voice or clone someone's voice with maybe a minute's worth of audio. We can clone someone's uh, visual image with maybe two minutes of video. But with all this other data around your personal taste preferences and also how you converse with other people over chat or speak to them over messenger, you know Facebook and all these other social media platforms could create an avatar of you that would be pretty convincing. You know, carry on a, a pretty. Uh, a pretty detailed conversation with all that knowledge and do so quite faithfully in a way that could be used for malfeasance. And that coupled with all the public data about you that's uploaded to YouTube and this, that, the other, you know, all the commentary on Reddit and Twitter and, and this, that, the other, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy what could actually happen. And in fact, in the hands of a bad actors, there are other things that could be done in, in addition to not just impersonating. They'd be able to do a pretty good uh, impersonation of a Ouija board and uh, summoning a, a long lost spirit of a dead relative or maybe someone who's passed away recently, you know, you could recreate their image and, and video call you and, you know, I'm actually not dead. I'm actually still alive. You know, imagine how traumatizing that will be to someone uh, being tricked into a scam where you know someone's you know, passed away and then all of a sudden a scam has resurrected them and, and trying to convince them that they're still alive and to do something. And I think ultimately someone probably will use this to create, I don't know, the second coming of Jesus Christ or get involved in religion in some way and convince a lot of people at scale that the rapture is here or, or, or something, um, there's some big event and, and use that to manipulate people at scale. And I think certainly we're going to see AI weaponized by countries I think each country will create their own version of the AI because, you know, if you go to war, you're not going to rely on open AI's 
APIs to be up and available to you. So you can see this weaponized in every country. You can be weaponized by intelligence agencies. You'll see it weaponized by political parties, and you'll see it weaponized by criminals. And it's going to be very, very difficult to um, to fight because I don't think we really have the technology to be able to deal with this. And 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 unfortunately, the the, the technology is here right now. And and I think we're probably going to see something fairly major happen probably in the next 12 months where someone will exploit it in one of these fields. It sounds like very, very imminently we have a risk. I mean, you're an international businessman. You travel a lot. I'm sure there are plenty of times when while you're traveling, you have occasion, you make a deal with somebody, you need to wire transfer millions of dollars from your freelancer account to you know some other business. How is that going to be authenticated in the future? Because the way most banks handle that today is if you send them an email, they'll say, well, Matt, we, we need to, to have a, a phone call to, to get a verbal you know, verification that it's really you and authorization. Well, we know from the opening of this week's show that that's not going to work. Okay, well, let's step it up. It's got to be a Zoom call where we can see you. We recognize you. We've met you face to face before. We know what you look like. Well, wait a minute. Now you said that they've already got the technology to spoof that so you create a, a mat on the zoom call that's not really mat it's the scammer who's trying to rip off a couple million bucks from freelancers account what are you and your banker going to do not someday but in the next 12 months to prevent that kind of fraud from from taking over we get emails quite frequently in this class known as ceo fraud where you know the email will come from matt3562 at gmail.com and ask my finance team Hey, I'm uh, I'm in a bit of a hurry. Uh, can you please do something very quickly? I'm in a meeting. Can you wire some money somewhere? And those those emails are usually coming out of Nigeria. They're very primitive in nature. My finance team knows how to detect them, but we get them very frequently. We get them probably on a weekly basis. But in the future, these emails will be driven by ChatGPT. It, they'll be trained on everything that I've I've said publicly, perhaps even this podcast. They'll be trained to use the nuances and the language they use. They may be audio calls, not actual emails. They may be video calls, 4K high fidelity video conference calls, you know, as myself coming in asking for, for money to be transferred or, or an Amazon gift card to be purchased or what have you, which is what they typically ask for. There's a class that of fraud that is operating at scale right now that's very similar to that, that's, that's um, quite tricky and um, has been quite successful around the world, which is payroll fraud which is where the finance department gets an email from a random person in the company saying, hey, I've just changed banks. Can you please update my bank details? And then the finance person reply, go, okay, you know, can you give me the account details? And they reply back. And what happens is they, get, is they get updated to some account that's been hacked by a fraudster. And then next payroll goes through. And it's a few weeks later, the person says, why haven't I been paid? And it turns out that that money's been stolen. That That's quite lucrative because- Obviously, people get paid a fair bit of money uh, each month, and if you can do that at scale, get quite a number of people um, to, to fall victim to it, and it, it seems quite a benign thing. Um, sometimes from a, from a payroll officer's perspective, it can be very, very, very lucrative for the scammers. A couple of years ago, actually, I spent one Anzac day here basically investigating a group of scammers who were perpetuating that fraud because we'd actually fallen uh, for it from our staff members, and I actually managed to find my way into the email account that was being used by the scammers to do this. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies and government organizations and what have you that were falling foul uh, to this particular scam. And when I spoke to the, 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 the federal police about this, you know, they said that you know, billions of dollars is being lost in this sort of fraud. And, and, and this is only going to just accelerate as the ability for, for high fidelity faking of people's identities is, is going to continue. I, I don't see how we're going to defend against this because it seems to me that the speed of advancement of the offense, which is AI, is so much faster than what the defense is capable of. If I look at something like two-factor authentication, uh, people figured out, I don't know, what, five, six years ago that it would be better to have two-factor authentication for security on most websites that do anything financial. It took the finance industry five years because of just the, the slow moving pace of bureau, you know corporate bureaucracy and so forth for most organizations to really figure that out and figure out how to do it and adopt it. And some of them screwed it up and had to do it over again and so forth. AI is going so fast, Matt. How are we possibly going to keep up with it if the defenses against these kinds of scam attacks require human paced activity, but the pace of advancement on the other side is at the pace of AI. 
I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, 30 years ago, we came up with cryptographic techniques to protect email communication in the form of things like PGP, pretty good privacy. Unfortunately, something as simple as that, which just has a public key and a private key, and the public key is the key you put out there and people can download it and encrypt emails and send you the email using that public key and use your private key to decrypt it. Even that has proven to be too, too difficult and too cumbersome to have any widespread adoption, even among really technical people. So we are going to have to think about these sort of protective mechanisms. And then the, then the other thing we got to worry about is that these cryptographic systems that potentially could help us in some way, public key, private key uh, you know, encryption is based upon, um, effectively asymmetric encryption is based on a very small number of number theoretic problems that we presume are difficult to solve, but may actually be easy if we find a, a secret or a trick. And there's been huge advances in things like quantum computing and potentially even with what's what's being discovered at OpenAI, where Ilya soared into the abyss and then we had this whole drama over the course of a weekend where the entire company quit and kind of came back again, where maybe some of these these protective mechanisms we can use to to try and solve the problem of authentication may be challenged uh, in the near future. Let's move on to the state of the AI uh, industry and how quickly it's advancing. Uh, of course, AI has actually been under development for more than 50 years. Uh, I was first exposed to it at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT in the 1970s. But I, I would say that OpenAI's chat GPT was kind of the, uh, the public offering where all of a sudden the whole world became aware of AI and its capabilities. That was, I don't know, a couple of years ago. It seems like just in the last few weeks, a whole bunch has happened. Elon Musk introduced uh, his alternative, which sounds like an anti-woke entrant to compete with ChatGPT. That one's called Grok. There's also a Google entrant, which is called Gemini. I think there's a couple others that you're probably more aware of than I am. Give us the, the state of the industry, who's doing what, and what is the significance of each one? What are they about? How do they differ from OpenAI's ChatGPT? Well, I mean, the industry is moving at, at, at light speed, and it almost feels like we're at the knee of that exponential curve into the singularity in, in, in some respects. Before I talk about the specific competing foundational models, I think I mean, one thing I want to point out is we are very close to the next kind of big phase in AI capabilities across the modalities, and that is the ability of the software to write itself. In the last couple of weeks, there was a pretty amazing demo. It's actually deceptively simple in, in terms of how it works, but there's a there's a software package called TL Draw, which is an online whiteboard, and it released a an upgrade called Make Real. And what Make Real allows you to do is just sketch out a little diagram of some software, for example, a Pong game or a Space Invaders game or whatever it may be, and then kind of hit a button and bang, that software is, is written automatically just from a sketch. And where this is heading is the ability of software to kind of write itself. You know, the thing that's been holding it back primarily has been the ability to fit, feed in a large context window or a, a large amount of input uh, into the models. And that effectively has been solved. And so very soon you'll be able to feed in very, very large code bases and be able to tell the software to do something. For example, chat GPT, please write a better version of chat GPT, thanks. And it'll be able to do it. And I think that is where things are going to go truly crazy. But where we are right now is we have a lot of models competing. And one of the reasons we have a lot of models competing against each other is, as Elias Sutskova, who's the chief scientist of AI, says himself, 40 papers in the field, which are public academic papers that anyone can download and read, describe about 90, 95% of the space. So really, everything is out there. Pandora's box is open. Anyone who has the resources, and that is the compute power and the training data and the money to be able to power all of that, can come out there and compete uh, with the model. And you're, you're seeing this at a quite a, quite an accelerated pace. There's a lot going on. So obviously, Elon does have Grok. I mean, one of the criticisms with OpenAI is that it's increasingly woke in that there's human feedback that goes into that model to try and you know, increase what they call it AI safety um, to stop it from spitting out how to make a nuclear bomb or um, provide medical advice or you know, how to steal a car or, or whatever it may be. And that RLHF, which is simply you know, putting two answers in front of a human and going, do you like the left one or do you like the right one? And then you know, repeatedly doing that. That is causing model drift. And there's certainly in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of conversation online about this, how GPT 
will no longer write code for you, how it's nerfed all the answers. And Anthropic's Claude engine is also getting a lot of flack saying it no longer writes creative fiction that well. And it's theorized that that it's either through the the RLHF training, which is out of control, and it's, you know, it's all out of Silicon Valley, so you've got a very left-leaning, very works of audience, so you can get, you know, ChatGPT has always been able to write a song about Joe Biden, but it's never been able to write a song about Donald Trump. Um, it's either that or there's been deliberate changes in the inference of the model so that it's been cutting costs to, so the answers are more terse and less verbose. But by the very nature of doing that, how whatever whatever they're doing, whether it, whether it's through the through the RLHF or whether it's through you know some cost cutting, they are creating competitors. And so so Elon, with all you know the, the big free speech push, and, and, and you know, he bought Twitter, and he's just overnight enabled Alex Jones's account to come back. And, and you know that, that his approach is basically to try and create a competitor that avoids that, as well as it has access to real time data. And and the other thing that's very interesting is the data that that Grok has access to is effectively Twitter or now called X which in a way is a search engine for the human brain. It's a very real-time contemporary data set of what everyone's thinking, which is a pretty unique data set that is out there in public. Then you've got you know, Google's efforts, and Google has really flubbed this entire industry. And it's really having a, a bit of a Kodak moment at the moment because you know the Google search engine was the original OG AI where Google told you, you know, put all your data out there in the public, put it out there for Google to easily scrape. There were all these rules about you know, high-quality content above the fold and this, that, the other. And Google sucked it all down, trained its AI, and then basically created a, a search engine whereby you could type any input and it would give you back 10 blue links and a hell of a lot of ads uh, in order to basically direct you to where you wanted to get to. Now, the problem is that model became incredibly ad-soaked. I don't know how many ads you get now when you type in you know, flowers, Manhattan, but it'll probably be 60 ads and 10 bits of organic content if you scroll right down the bottom of the page. And that sort of interface is not tolerated at all in the, in the chat-based world, particularly when there's so many competitors and the, and the answer's all very clean and very, very precise and people have enough of a problem with, with the answers being woke. So Google has been very slow to get that technology out there. I mean, they did a demo years ago of a thing known as Google Duplex, which could, for audio calls, basically replace your receptionist or your appointment setter at a hairdresser and take a call from someone and kind of, you know, book them in and take their credit card details and so forth. They did this demo years ago, but that technology never really saw the light of day. And now they've been, you know, they flubbed the whole BARD launch on day one. There were significant problems with that. And now they've come out with Gemini in the last week. Now, Gemini is supposed to be the big answer to GPT-4. The big song and dance was that Gemini beats GPT-4 across a bunch of benchmarks, including uh, one called MMLU, which for the first time has surpassed human level of performance. Now, the problem with all of this is that if you actually look past the press release and past the video, Gemini is not just one model. There are three models there. There's Ultra, there's Pro, and there's Nano. Ultra is the model that the touting is beating GPT-4 by a couple of percent on some benchmarks. It's done through what's known as chain of the thought, which is basically stepping through problems as the human would think about them in, in terms of a logical step, and self-consistency, which is making sure that across you know, large bits of context that the answers are making sense in a nutshell. That ultra model doesn't exist. <laughs> the, the one that they're touting as beating GPT-4 is not publicly available. It won't be available until next year. In fact, the model that is available right now, if you go to BARD and, and play with it, is Pro. And Pro is actually worse than GPT-4 and only beats Palm2L, which is one of the previous Google models, on two benchmarks. And then you've got Nano, which is designed for handsets and so forth. So their big announcement seems a very premature and very rushed because they're touting all success with Ultra and Ultra is not available. And and to couple with all of that, the video, which was quite polished that they produced with it, was faked. And they've now admitted it was fake in that in that they kind of spliced together a bunch of things and edited it to kind of write a demo. And it's kind of theorized the reason why Google has, has, has rushed this whole Gemini release is because before the end of the year, OpenAI will be releasing the next version of GPT, which is rumored to be 4.5. And they wanted to get something out before then to kind of say, well, we've kind of leapfrogged for before 4.5 comes out and leaves them even further behind. And Google, I think, has a real challenge because they've really they've really got you know, two major revenue streams. One major revenue stream is this ad model. And, and in the chat-based world, there is no tolerance for even tainted responses, let alone ads everywhere. And the other is, you know, obviously, their G Suite s- uh, series of uh, office 
tooling where you've got Google Docs, Google Sheets, what have you. And I think it's going to be very shortly and perhaps a close moment for SaaS where companies, particularly large organizations, are going to realize that they don't want their data in the cloud. They don't want their data in in, in Google Docs. They don't want their data you know, in these big SaaS systems because the temptation to train on that data in the models, maybe not explicitly, maybe, maybe in a very subtle way, is going to be too great because the internet is rapidly going dark uh, as you're seeing right across the space, whether it's Reddit increasing tariffs on access to, through their API, whether it's Twitter, um, now it's minimum $42,000 US a month in order to access their data, whether it's Stack Exchange, you know, banning access or ArtStation or Getty Images or, you know, any of the portfolio sites cutting access. You know, the, 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 the access to this data is going to get very, very tough. And I think the temptation in these big SaaS platforms is going to be too great that they're going to peak at it. And they already do peak it. I mean, if I go into my Gmail and I go and just, you know, click around, there's ads occasionally in there. And they're obviously looking at my email in order to generate those ads. So they are doing it in a very subtle way already. So I think Google Google has a real a real problem and a real real codec moment. If you can c- compare and contrast that product launch, which was which was a complete mess again, with what happened with a small French team called Mistral, uh, literally over the weekend, where they just flopped out on on, on Twitter a, a link to a BitTorrent <laughs> of an eighty seven um, gigabyte model, which was um, that that was basically the announcement. Is like, here you are, bang, and and there really performing extremely well in terms of the, the, the quality of their models. That particular model, which is an eight by seven um, billion parameter mixture of experts model, is really, when people look at it, it's actually performing quite well. And it looks to be a very scaled down version of, of GPT-4 in terms of how it's been designed. So so there's a lot of competition out there from a lot of different angles. And you know, as I've said previously, and as, as Ilya has said, you know, 40 papers describe 90, 95% of the space. So you basically just need access to compute, access to training data and money in order to to train these models, and I th- I think that not only is it challenging for Google, but I don't even think that OpenAI really has a sustainable competitive advantage in the long term. And so what what's what's OpenAI doing as a, as a res- result of that? Where well, you had Sam Altman do a world tour on par with John Elton's uh, Farewell Yellow Brick Road, talking about regulation, saying that we should regulate the entire space and set up an international atomic energy association um, to ba- to basically stop it, which is exactly what an incumbent would do if they were worried about not having an edge and all these new new, new entrants to the space. And then you had all this drama that happened over the space of a weekend, which, oh my God, it, it was bigger than um, days of our lives in terms of all the drama. You had Sam, Sam was fired as being CEO. He quit. Then Greg Brockman, who's the co-founder and president, quit. Then 747 of 770 employees also threatened to leave. The next minute he was going to... Microsoft, and which would have been the coup of the decade. Then you then you had an interim. The, the CTO was appointed the interim CEO. Then you had Emmett Shear come in as the interim CEO. Then the whole thing kind of, you know, everyone was going to Microsoft. It was going to be a Microsoft acquisition, and then they're trying to sell the company to Anthropic. And next thing you know, Sam was back, and then they, they concocted this whole story that the reason why it happened was because Ilya stared into the abyss at the heart of GPT and saw QSTAR, and it was potentially the end of the world. And therefore, he had to make a move because he had to slow down this space because humanity, the probability of doom increased dramatically. And Sam was too commercial and pushed him too too far as an accelerationist. And so therefore, he had to decel. It was (laughs) all very, very dramatic. But let me tell you, if the probability of doom is greater than epsilon, i.e. a very small number, then the reality is the Department of Defense should come in and just seize the project. So they have to kind of be, I think, be a little bit careful about being too too disruptive. I think Peter Thiel said, best me said, disruptive kids go to the principal's office. I mean, making this whole song and dance about how potentially it's the end of the world. I mean, if that is even remotely the chance, the whole project should be seized by defense. Well, it sounds to me, Matt, like it's too late for that because there are computers. You can't shut – I mean, the only way I could see to possibly – defend this would be to somehow just outlaw computers, turn them all off. Well, we can't do that because we can't run society without computers. We're completely dependent on them. If there's computers and there's smart people who can read only 40 different white papers that basically give all of the knowledge for how to do this. Uh, you know, what I said in, in my closing remarks on our August interview is I think AI is rapidly 
reaching the point where it will be second only to nuclear weapons in terms of the threat that it poses to humanity. Well, what I've realized is I got that wrong because in nuclear weapons, even when everybody knows how to build one, which is already the case now, getting your hands on the enriched fissile material is still very difficult because you'd have to build that the cascade of centrifuges in order to do it yourself, which is beyond any, any terrorist's capability so far. There is no such uh, centrifuge requirement for AI. Any smart guy who's got a computer science degree and read those 40 papers uh, and has a little bit of money to spend in some computers can, can reproduce all of this stuff. There's, and the attitude of the military has been full speed ahead. And exactly as I predicted in that August interview, their attitude is basically, if we don't do it, then our enemies will do it and we'll have a disadvantage. So therefore, we can't afford not to do it. So we're going full speed ahead with all of this AI stuff. It can't be stopped. It's too late to stop it. And from the things that you've said, I guess, you know, when I read your, your latest piece, although I definitely, uh, the, the title, AI Apocalypse, definitely resonates with me. What you say in there is you're talking about this period of, of uh, technology enlightenment where you could simply take the, the you know, chat GPT version 7 or something and say, look, I'll give you a very simple prompt. Go and read and process every single word that's ever been written on science and engineering and look for new ways to apply all of those technologies to make life better. Well, sure, that's possible. But I think before we get to chat GPT 5, we're going to get to people that are, you know, programming Angelina Jolie bots to take down society by seducing everybody on the the AI version of OnlyFans that's free. Um, I, I don't understand why you're so optimistic. Uh, it seems to me like this is really doomsday stuff. Well, <laughs> yeah, <let's>... sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, I do think there is going to be extreme challenges and threats from the AI through deception and persuasion. And I think that's where the real threat is, where it's not going to be the AI making a nuclear bomb, it's, or it's going to be the AI persuading someone who's got the keys to the kingdom uh, in order to you know, attack a particular country or do something that leads or cascades into, 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 into war. And I, I guess that's, the, that's kind of like the plot to, to Terminator, isn't it? Like the whole... The whole plot was uh, was that when Skynet became self aware, it, it it tricked the Americans into I think bombing Russia, and and that led to led to basically war, and that was kind of that was that was the approach. And I think that, that there is a real risk there for sure, and and the technology is here right now in order to be able to do that with real time you know, video synthesis of of conversations, and that's going to have to be solved somehow, and I don't know how it's going to be solved. When, when we talk about, well, anyone who's got access to those 40 papers and some compute power, what have you, I mean, the compute power needed is gigantic. I mean, it's about 63 million US dollars per training run is the estimate for, for GPT-4. And the ability to get to act that sort of compute power is quite restricted. The amount of money need, needed is, is, is very, very high. And I do think there's going to be a change in the access to data in the future. I think, you know, the, I talked about the internet going dark. I think that people are going to probably second think about what data they share online. And I think a lot of these platforms are going to really become closed and the logged out internet is going to kind of disappear. So I think there will be potentially some natural limits in the form of access to data, tariffs on data, regulation around data and and, and so on. But, you know, we certainly are entering a brave new world. I mean, I think DeepMind just recently um, uh, ran a – someone someone basically queried uh, DeepMind and said, can you find um, a whole bunch of new chemical elements that might be um, stable? That we don't know about, and I think it, it generated two million potential candidates, of which it thinks many tens of thousands are stable, and they're going through now uh, with a again, with a robot chemist actually manufacturing these elements to see what properties they actually have. So I I, I do think we're we are entering into, into a certainly into an age of enlightenment. I'm just think just think about I mean it wouldn't be too much of a capability for going into the GPT we have now and figuring out ways to ask to go well what research have we discovered in certain areas where the learnings from that would be directly applicable to a completely different field of research that no one ever thought of, and what breakthroughs could we actually have? And I and I and I do think there'll be there'll, there'll be a lot coming out of that in terms of engineering in particular, as well as scientific breakthroughs. But yeah, in, ter in, ter in terms of the risks um, and and terrorism strategies, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And in, I mean, it's funny in the in the early models of uh, GPT, you could actually ask it directly around terrorism strategies because you could jailbreak it. 
Um, you, know, you could you could just directly ask it. You know, if if you know what would be the most effective way to cause chaos, you know, in the West, and it would tell you. And I have to believe there will be jailbroken versions or cracked versions in the future that will have all of the capability of you know Chat GPT four five six seven, which somebody figures out how to crack or jailbreak in a way that they can use all of that power to design the next uh, e- evil event. So uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm the pessimist in this story. We're gonna uh, we're coming up on an hour though, Matt. So we're we're gonna have to leave it here before uh, I let you go. Please tell our listeners first of all, we, we've got a link in the research roundup to AI Apocalypse Now. I implore everyone to take a look at that because this really is uh, either uh, enlightenment is coming or or disaster is coming or both. So I think it really is important. But for people who want to follow your work more generally, uh, how can they do that? You're normally busy as the uh, CEO of freelancer.com. Uh, are you publishing your, your AI learnings on any kind of blog or something, or how can people keep up with you? You can either follow me on Twitter or Matt, M-A-T-T underscore Barry, B-A-R-R-I-E, or on Medium is where I publish my long form essays. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Energy Transition Crisis, my new video documentary series about energy transition, has finally been released, and anyone can watch it for free at energytransitioncrisis.org. The series explains exactly what it's really going to take to break humanity's addiction to fossil fuels and why it will take longer and cost more than almost anyone realizes. And I'd like to think the three episodes on nuclear energy are among the most detailed on YouTube. This is a passion project for me, and there's no profit motive, no revenue, and therefore no budget other than donations. I'd really appreciate your help promoting the series. Things you can do to help include subscribing to the Energy Crisis Doc YouTube channel, liking every episode, posting comments on YouTube, and posting links to your favorite episodes on social media. If you don't have time to do those things, there's also a donations page at energytransitioncrisis.org. The money does not go to me. 100% of it will be spent on YouTube and other social media advertising to promote the series. Thanks in advance for your help. Now let's get back to the show and Patrick's post-game chart deck. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Matt back on the show. That was a heck of an interview. Any thoughts, reflections on it? In my closing comments after Matt's August interview, I went out on a limb and said that to my thinking, AI was tied with nuclear weapons as the greatest existential threat to humanity. I'll go even farther out on that same limb now and say that the risk of some kind of horrific outcome has increased considerably just in the last few months, and that absolutely nothing can be done at this point to stop it. Going back to nuclear weapons, all it would take to start a thermonuclear holocaust would be for jihadists seeking revenge against the United States for supporting the Israel-Gaza conflict to get a hold of a jailbroken version of ChatGPT-4 and ask it how to trick the U.S. intelligence agencies into thinking that a nuclear first strike on American soil from either China or Russia or both is imminent. That might be accomplished by sending some weekly encrypted messages described U.S. target locations from Russian IP addresses to Chinese IP addresses, intending for the NSA to intercept those transmissions and provoke a U.S. reaction. In other words, spook the Pentagon to get Biden to shoot first, knowing that Russia and China will retaliate and vaporize the United States. Now, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to fool the U.S. intelligence community into thinking that such things are really happening, but a jailbroken version of ChatGPT is. And make no mistake, all these nonsensical hearings that are now being held about how to regulate or constrain AI are nothing but political grandstanding by politicians too naive to comprehend their own irrelevance. It's far too late to do anything that would actually be effective to restrain AI. Of course, everything Matt said on the positive side is equally true. 
rereading every word of science and engineering ever written and systematically looking for how to apply known technologies to new problems to make the world a better place is nothing short of miraculous. And we should expect to get some really nice benefits from that before the lights go out from the coming AI-generated cyber attacks on our infrastructure. But my pessimism couldn't be stronger for the nefarious applications of AI to eventually outweigh the benefits of all the good that AI is certain to bring to the world. I got the call for a regional war escalation and a crude oil spike over $100 dead wrong. So let's all hope that I have this one even more wrong. If I'm right, the first confirmation will come in the form of an AI-driven fraud and scam epidemic within the next 18 months that catches everyone off guard because it's much bigger and more complex than anyone ever imagined possible. If that happens, please remember, it's just the beginning, and it's really nothing in the grand scheme of things. Frauds and scams are just financial crimes motivated by financial greed. It's the truly evil deeds that AI will eventually be used to perpetrate that we need to worry most about. And they'll be so extreme as to defy comprehension. The first signs that that's actually happening will be a wave of cyber attacks that only AI could dream up. And those cyber attacks are more likely to occur on unobvious targets with less defenses than the targets most people would think of, such as the Pentagon and other obvious high-value but also high-effort victims. Sorry, folks, just calling them like I see them. And there's absolutely nothing that can be done at this late stage in the game to stop it. So we might as well all just sit back, relax, and see what happens. On that upbeat note, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Alarnik. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Matt's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's get to crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory. EIA printed a drawdown of 4.3 million barrels of crude oil, but Cushing, Oklahoma, built 1.2 million barrels of desperately needed crude, bringing the supply in Cushing back up to a little closer to normal levels. Gasoline building 409,000 barrels, distillates building 1.5 million barrels. U.S. production held unchanged at 13.1 million barrels. The market has been plumbing lower lows every single day. The clear reason is exactly as I explained last week. The market perceives that OPEC Plus has suffered a breakdown of solidarity within its membership and that it can no longer manage the market and defend the price. A secondary explanation that not nearly as many people are talking about is the possibility that Vladimir Putin may prefer not to seek higher oil prices because the U.S. shale patch has seen so much growth and success since the Ukraine conflict began. Russia is already selling its oil below the market and may have already negotiated some fixed-price deals that we don't know about. If they have, Putin has no reason to want the rest of the world to continue paying more for unsanctioned oil than Russia's getting for its sanctioned oil in the black market. There's no reason to expect an upside trend reversal on the crude oil chart unless OPEC Plus restores solidarity or the perception of solidarity and evidences that it can further cut production. Now, I think they can fairly easily shore up that solidarity and cut production, but there still remains an open question as to whether or not they still want to defend higher crude prices, given how much those prices have helped U.S. shale producers to gain market share. Bottom line, as Patrick has said several times in recent weeks, we need to move back above $80 on WTI to signal an honest-to-goodness upside trend reversal. As I'm recording early on Thursday morning, we're still struggling to get over $70 a barrel. So we have a long way to go. A geopolitical upset could still do the trick, but now that we're less than a year away from the presidential election, President Biden can't afford to do anything to jeopardize gasoline prices. For that reason, I think the U.S. is very unlikely to provoke any military escalation that risks higher oil prices. 
Yeah, Eric, I have a, a chart on page two with that crude oil and I put that 50 day moving average on there and you can see uh, that right now it's a very decisive downtrend that has been uh, in play for almost two months now, but we are testing the year lows. And uh, while it is going to take a lot of work to re reverse this chart, this is actually a level where it makes a lot of sense for support to hold. And uh, so over going into the holiday period, it'll be really interesting to see whether we see the basing formations and reversal patterns in play that uh, can establish the base from which oil may turn in the new year. The, in, uh, the first observation I'll make is the just ba uh, breaking last week's highs around the $72 level. Uh, that would mean that uh, with this pattern of lower highs and lower lows would have been broken. But again, that wouldn't make it an uptrend. I think that we're going to need a lot of work uh, uh, into the mid 70s and definitely a clearing of $80 to confirm a new bull uptrend. Now, Eric, what are your thoughts here on equities? Well, I've already hedged by buying puts on uh, S&P futures at the 4,400 strike. But my view of the equity market is changing as I watch this relentless rally continue to march higher. The Dow has already printed a new all-time high, and the S&P isn't far behind. If the dovish exuberance coming off Wednesday's FOMC meeting continues, it'll soon take the S&P to new all-time highs, and that by itself will cause many traders to add to their longs, extending the rally even further. But the real reason that I'm turning much less bearish is that it's an election year, and Biden simply cannot afford a major economic downturn. We've already seen plenty of clear evidence that the Fed is more political than it's willing to admit, and the desire of the establishment to keep Trump out of the White House, no matter what it takes, is likely to influence the Fed just as much as other policymakers. I don't think the major secular inflation trend is over by any stretch of the imagination, but it's clear that the pandemic-induced transitory aggravators of inflation have already peaked and that inflation is under control, at least in the short term. That gives the Fed plenty of scope to use the gigantic increase that's already occurred in interest rates from 0% to 5.5% to begin an aggressive easing campaign from now all the way into the November election if they feel so inclined. For all these reasons, while I still think the underlying macro dynamics say that the recession is more than overdue, I also think the Fed has room to hold that recession off until after the election if they really pull out all the stops. And keeping Trump out of the White House may be sufficient motivation for them to do exactly that. There's no reason for them to cut aggressively so long as the market remains strong. But if it starts to roll over, I think they're likely to be much more aggressive in their response to rescue the market than a lot of people are assuming. Of course, you always have to pay the piper someday. So if they manage to keep this economy afloat through the election with dovish policy, we'll eventually pay for it with another big wave of inflation. But I think they have more than enough room to kick the can down the road for another year if they want to. It would take 11 50 basis point cuts to take us back to zero rates. And there's far fewer than 11 FOMC meetings left between now and the election. All right, I want to get Nick involved in this conversation. Let's uh, start off with uh, just looking at the levels implied by the options markets here, bud. Yeah, Patrick. So the spot price right now on SPX is approximately 47.10. The implied move for the January 19th monthly OPEX is plus minus 120 points, which denotes a potential upside of 48.30, which would exceed all-time highs, and a potential downside of 45.90. Now, right now, we have key resistance above at 4,800 just near those all-time highs and key support below at 4,600. Given the rapidity of the move up over the last few weeks, I mentioned last week I thought we'd see a top out area of around 4,650. Now Powell came in dovish instead of hawkish yesterday, which spurred the market a bit higher than I thought it would push. That being said, I do think post-monthly OPEX for December, which is tomorrow, we'll see a decline into next week somewhere around the 4,650 area, possibly as low as 4,590. Uh, before resumption to the upside at new all-time highs into the January OPEX. Following that, I do think we see some turbulence into middle of next year with downside around 4,000. That's my longer-term view. Nick, those are great observations. The S&P 500, uh, I put on page four, the weekly chart, is just 
testing its all-time high. Uh, and this is actually a really important technical moment because uh, if for whatever reason the market did have actually the bullish follow-through impulse to break to a higher high, uh, it's going to uh, rowel up the animal spirits and investors. And it'll be really hard to say that it's it's just going to stop here. I mean, we could even burst to 5,000 on the upside just on that momentum alone. With that said, typically when testing a previous high like this, it is a, a level that usually acts as resistance and that first test often uh, rejects there. And so it'll be really interesting to see whether or not the market fades off of a retest of these highs to the kind of levels you were suggesting, uh, you know, retesting down toward 4650 or something like that would be completely realistic. Uh, but uh, boy, are we at an interesting moment in the markets where uh, where Powell uh, is uh, certainly not creating any resistance for the bulls to uh, embrace that dovishness. Well, moving on, Nick, uh, let's look at that NASDAQ. What levels are you watching? So right now, spot price on the Qs is approximately 406. We have an implied move of plus minus 15 points into the January 19th OPEX. That would imply an upside of 421, well above the previous all-time highs, which are only about 1% away, and a lower potential move of 391. Right now, key resistance is the all-time high, which is around 408.71, uh, less than 1% from the current price, and key support is at 400, which was breached yesterday. So again, as I said in previous weeks, I'm not as bullish on tech. Obviously, it's at all-time highs, so I've been wrong there, but the reason why I've been bearish on tech is because I've been pair trading Russell against tech. So long Russell, short tech. And thus far, it's proved to be a very fruitful trade as the Russell is outperforming the market handily. Uh, I think that will continue to, to happen as we look at the Russell right now as being the only of, of the large indices to not be near all-time highs. Currently, it's about 25% off all-time highs. Meanwhile, you have the Dow, the S&P and the NASDAQ all trading near or, or at all-time highs. Uh, I do think that the tech will slow down, and I do think that uh, the Russell will outperform in the short term as well as the medium term, especially given that Powell was very, very dovish yesterday. That spurred risk on for all assets. We're seeing kind of a rally in every class right now, which is kind of um, a, a rare sight to see. Nick, it is interesting to see that the Mag 7 didn't really have any gusto in the move. And you're right, the small caps are really where uh, the outperformance has been. And what's interesting, though, is that on page six, we have the volatility index. And here we are uh, at multi-year lows of uh, volatility. I mean, uh, we're down uh, almost below the 12 handle. It's, we haven't seen this kind of volatility in the post-COVID period uh, at all. And so uh, very calm markets uh, in in there. What do you take away from the volatility here? So right now with the VIX at around a 12 handle, we can expect approximately top to bottom moves in the S&P of about 0.75%. Um, right now, looking at it being this low, again, I've said in previous weeks, you have to be very, very careful with selling premium because again, these abrupt moves that can happen intraday can burn you very, very fast. On longer term time horizons, you know, hedging has never been cheaper. And I do think that it makes a lot of sense to purchase hedges for middle of 2024, perhaps. I mentioned last week a trade that I'm looking at, which is uh, a bear call spread, the 4650, 4700 bear call spread for February OPEX on SPX. Currently, it's yielding about $38 of credit with $12 of risk, and then parlaying that into a 4500 put spread, which means that um, you're pretty much having $500 of upside on that spread with current cost of about $15. So risking about $15 to make uh, $485 or so. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to head down to $3,500 on SPX. The reason why it's so wide is because any kind of pullback or any kind of pop in volatility will spur that position to the upside somewhere around $30 or $50, and it can double in value very, very fast. So it's kind of a, a trade that I'm looking at right now. I have not put it on yet, but um, I will be monitoring that closely. Now, moving on to page seven, we have the US dollar index. What are your thoughts here? The dovish surprise from the FOMC halted the grind higher, but the test will be whether we can get a daily close below 102 on the December Dixie contract. If we do, that would signal that the trend lower in the dollar is back on, at least for now. 
Eric, you're right. The dovish surprise uh, really spurred that dollar lower, and uh, we don't n- see the reactions yet uh, from uh, the ECB. But if uh, this has started a new down leg in the dollar, uh, it may uh, come right down to the 100 handle uh, on the um, uh, Dixie. And that truly can be a tailwind for, for risk assets and uh, and things like gold. So it'll be really interesting to see uh, whether um, the follow through continues. Now, Eric, you added in this chart on gold on page eight. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts here. I added my own gold chart to the deck this week to illustrate the conundrum I see in this market. There are two price channels in play here. The big one dates back to the November 2022 low around 1620, and that's the major uptrend. Then there's a much steeper upward channel that starts from the October 6th low just before the Hamas attack on Israel. The second leg of that narrower channel has an upside measured move target of 2140, and we already hit that target. As we discussed last week, I thought 2020 was going to hold this market on the retrace, or that maybe at the worst case, we might see a very brief retest of 2003, which at that time was channel support on the narrow channel. When we broke down below that decisively this week on fears about which way the CPI print and the FOMC meeting might go, I became concerned that the steeper channel had now been invalidated, and if sustained, that could signal that a move all the way down to 1880 could be in the cards. That still wouldn't invalidate the major uptrend in the wider channel, but it would be a move that many traders were not expecting. The market tested 1988 on Tuesday evening and was looking pretty ominous going into the FOMC statement. The dovish surprise of Wednesday's FOMC statement gives the appearance of having changed everything. Now suddenly the market's back up in the steep and narrow up channel, and it's tempting to pop the champagne corks and declare 2300 is the next upside target. But until the knee-jerk of the FOMC statement, this chart was looking awfully bearish, and the sudden move off the sub-2000 level before the FOMC left plenty of single prints on the TPO chart, implying that a downside retracement could still be in the cards once the initial exuberance of the dovish FOMC surprise wears off. And as I'm recording this around 5 a.m. on Thursday morning, after Europe opened at 4 a.m., there was no continuation of the rally. The market actually drifted a couple of dollars lower in the first hour or so of European trading. So already that rally has at least been checked or hasn't continued at least uh, since Europe opened. So long as the news flow continues to be dovish and the market continues to expect rate cuts rather than rate hikes, I think the charge higher is probably going to be back on. My point is simply that it would only take a little bit of hawkish messaging from the Fed to knock the yellow metal out of that steep and narrow up channel. If that happens, we need to prepare for the possibility of a test of 1900 or even lower. That still wouldn't invalidate the larger uptrend depicted by the wider channel. But when you consider that we already hit the upside measured move target on December 4th of 2140, which was also a new all-time high, and then printed a gigantic reversal candle on the very same day, the risk that this downside correction still isn't over remains very real. That was a false upside breakout from a new all-time high that quickly reversed to more than $100 below the prior all-time high level, and that's an inherently bearish signal. The last several times we tested all-time highs in gold, corrections several hundred dollars lower ensued each time. On the positive side, the move down to 1988 pushed the slow stochastics into deeply oversold territory, and now they're pointed straight back up, thanks to the dovish FOMC surprise. If we can keep the upside momentum going for a few more days, and particularly if we can get above the prior all-time high zone between 2063 and 2085, I'll be ready then to sound the all clear and figure that 2188 is the next measured move target higher. But if we break down out of the steep and narrow channel, and particularly if we see a new daily close below 1988, I think it makes sense to reset our sights on 1900 or below as the downside target for this correction before the broader uptrend continues. 
Eric, generally, I agree with your channels. I, uh, overall, uh, the w- the way I look at it, though, is is that the pattern of higher highs and higher lows has not uh, been broken, and especially uh, the breakout on the upside of gold uh, has now occurred on the breakdown of the dollar. And so, if we uh, look at it from an inner market perspective, if we do have a dollar that remains weak over the coming weeks, that could become uh, the environment from where gold uh, can follow through to the upper boundary of that channel and especially you know you're pointing out that stochastic it certainly uh, can be the turn up point on that what I want to just uh, highlight though on page 9 is I put the monthly chart on gold and uh, that has a 50 month moving average on there and what you can observe is that uh, over the last several decades gold has been progressing higher uh, and consolidating up along this 2000 level we saw gold uh, closing at a fresh multi-month high uh, on a closing basis uh, and so in many ways gold has broken out and uh, and if we continue to see a dovish fed uh, then it certainly can lead to uh, some substantial follow-through on the upside uh, i certainly think that uh, positioning bullishly here on gold remains a reasonable proposition eric you wanted to comment on uranium what's on your mind here This week's news is that the U.S. Congress is moving to advance new legislation that would ban the importation of Russian enriched uranium products, meaning nuclear reactor fuel. The significance of this is that we simply don't have the domestic supply, either of the uranium or of the uh, conversion and enrichment facilities needed to create those enriched uranium products. So if this bill is passed, it could put even more upside pressure on the price of domestic U-308 uranium, as well as more pressure on the conversion and enrichment facilities, which frankly don't exist anymore in the United States. That's very bullish for U.S. uranium mining shares. That certainly will continue to be a tailwind, Eric. And when we look at that chart on page 10, the trend has been relentless that the U-308 uh, continues to just truck along on the upside. And uh, and the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which we have the chart of, just keeps making higher highs, higher lows in a beautiful upwards channel uh, that really does not seem to be interrupted at this moment. There could easily still be a 10% upside on this chart move. And while it's been a, it's a very mature trend that's been in play for uh, for almost a half a year, but uh, overall, there's no evidence that uh, the uh, the trend has shifted or it's imminently going to stall. So, remaining bullish uranium makes a whole lot of sense. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to BigPictureTrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, in this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview and the chart book that we just discussed here in the post game, including a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at Research Roundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
and the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.